Lord Star's Ice Bowl QB sneak, the Philly special, the New Orleans Saints onside kick to start the second half in Super Bowl 44. You name it. There are so many gutsy coaching calls that are permanently cemented in NFL history. When it comes to making a risky decision, there are two possibilities. It works out and the coach looks like a super genius, or it fails and everyone criticizes him forever. Well, today we're focusing on the latter outcome as we look at the 10 absolute worst NFL playoff coaching calls of all time. Number 10. Mike Holmgren tells Packers to let the Broncos score. The defending champion Green Bay Packers met John Elway's Denver Broncos in Super Bowl 32. The heavily favored Packers had no answer for Terrell Davis, and the Denver defense kept MVP Brett Favre in the offense in check. A game that should have been a relative cakewalk for Green Bay was tied 24 apiece with two minutes to go. An offensive holding penalty set up a first and goal situation back at the Green Bay 18-yard line. Davis took the handoff and ran it 17 yards to the Green Bay 1, setting up a second and goal situation. Packers head coach Mike Holmgren got mixed up and thought it was a first and goal, and he feared that Denver would melt the clock and leave the offense with almost no time to score. Davis easily walked into the end zone for six, giving Green Bay 1 minute 45 seconds left to drive the field and force overtime. The Packers drove to the Denver 32-yard line before turning it over on downs to fall 31-24. to After the game, Holmgren admitted his mistake, believing he was giving his team the best chance to win. Hindsight is 2020, but if Green Bay holds Denver to a field goal, well, that makes it a lot easier for Favre to drive his team downfield and set up a game-tying field goal attempt. Number 9. Mike Rabel punts on 4th and 2. Trailing the Baltimore Ravens 17-13 early in the fourth quarter of their 2020 wildcard battle, the Titans pieced together a promising drive. Ryan Tannehill threw two straight incomplete passes from the Baltimore 40 to bring up fourth and two, and the usually aggressive Rabel should have went for it with zero hesitation. I mean, you have Derrick Henry in your backfield, you're in the opposition's end of the field, and you need a touchdown with just over 10 minutes remaining. So why not go for it on fourth and two? Nobody will understand it. But Vrabel inexplicably made the decision to punt it away instead. Just decided to punt. Thought we were playing well defensively. Thought we would get a get a punt inside of ten and you know be able to play the field position game. The Ravens bled valuable time off the clock, and it ended with a Justin Tucker field goal that increased the lead to seven. On the ensuing drive, Tannehill was picked off by Marcus Peters to seal the game. The interception was costly, but the Titans' best chance to take a lead was on the previous drive, when their coach opted to punt it away instead of trying to win the game. Number 8. John Fox sits on it. The Denver Broncos had the chance to put the mile-high miracle behind them and fast. Yes, it was stunning and quite devastating to let Joe Flacco complete a 70-yard Hail Mary to Jacoby Jones with 31 seconds left to tie it up. Blown coverage 101 by the Broncos. But the good news, they still had 31 seconds and two timeouts left for Peyton Manning to set up the game-winning field goal. Manning pieced together a fine performance with 28 completions, 290 passing yards, and three touchdowns. John Fox had every reason to trust that Manning could go down and set his team up for a game-winning field goal attempt. Instead, he ordered number 18 to kneel and play for overtime. Manning with two timeouts, gonna take a knee. Kraut doesn't like it, but they're gonna take their chances in overtime. Well, that plan failed miserably. Following a series of punts in overtime, Manning threw a brutal interception to Corey Graham at the Denver 45. The Ravens made use of the short field, with Justin Tucker booting the game-winning 47-yard field goal. That sent Baltimore to the 2012 AFC Championship game. After defeating the New England Patriots, they conquered the San Francisco 49ers in Super Bowl 47. That whole journey probably doesn't happen if Fox puts the game in Manning's hands, but that's just our guess. Number 7. Falcons forget basic clock management. The Atlanta Falcons held a 28-3 lead over the New England Patriots in Super Bowl 51. The clock was Atlanta's friend, but head coach Dan Quinn and offensive coordinator Kyle Shanahan inexplicably decided to stay overly aggressive the entire way. New England cut the lead to 8 with 5 minutes 56 seconds to go, but MVP Matt Ryan and the Atlanta offense needed just one last scoring drive to put it away. Matty Ice found Julio Jones for a jaw dropping tiptoe sideline catch at the New England 22. Only 4 minutes, 40 seconds left on the clock, and Atlanta could have basically just ran it three times, forcing New England to burn all of their timeouts, then make it a two-score game with an easy field goal. But on 2nd and 11, Atlanta called for a passing play. Trey Flowers quickly got to Ray and sacked him to force the Falcons out of field goal range. 
On a subsequent holding penalty and an incompletion forced Atlanta to punt. Now they're giving the ball back, no attempt on a field goal, and they're going to put Tom Brady in position to tie this game up. And you know the rest. Tom Brady and the Patriots go down the field with ease, force overtime, win the coin toss, and win it on a James White rushing score. Hey, the Falcons just had to run the ball once or twice and the game was over. Their coach totally cost them a Lombardi trophy. Number six, Joe Gibbs runs the failed screen pass. Joe Gibbs guided Washington to a Super Bowl 18 appearance against the Los Angeles Raiders, looking to successfully defend their Lombardi trophy. But the high-powered Washington offense that scored a whopping 541 points in the regular season could only muster three points in the first half. The Raiders led 14-3 with only 12 seconds remaining until halftime. Backed up at their own 12-yard line, Washington should have simply taken a knee and went into halftime looking to regroup. Instead, Gibbs called for Joe Theismann to try a screen pass that ended in disaster. That costly pick six ended any hope of a Washington comeback. The Raiders continued to pour it on, and they ran away with an easy 38-9 victory. Why the legendary head coach called for a high-risk, low-reward play at that point is up for debate to this day. I'll tell you, that's one that I'm sure Joe Gibbs, Joe Theismann wished that they had had back. Joe Gibbs, he can't be too happy about that decision. Number five. Bill Belichick's imperfect call costs a perfect season. For New England Patriots fans, there are so many what-ifs in Super Bowl 42. What if Asante Samuel didn't drop that game-stealing interception? What if they sacked Eli Manning and thwarted the legendary helmet catch to David Tyree? What if Tom Brady threw that late desperation heave to Randy Moss just a little further? Well, let's not forget Bill Belichick's risky decision-making in the third quarter that played a factor in the Patriots' heartbreaking loss. The Pats led 7-3 with less than 7 minutes remaining in the third. Facing a 4th and 13 situation at the New York Giants 31, Belichick could have sent out kicker Stephen Guskowski for a 48-yard attempt. Instead, he asked his record-setting offense to convert a miracle 4th and 13 play, which went nowhere. Well, guess what the final score was? 17 to 14 for the Giants. Belichick may be the greatest coach of all time, but getting too cute on this occasion was a major factor in the Giants spoiling the Patriots' perfect season. Number 4. Matt LaFleur's field goal ends the Packers There were a number of questionable coaching decisions during the 2020-21 NFL playoffs, but none were more questionable than this call from Matt LaFleur. With 2 minutes 9 seconds remaining in the NFC Championship game and his Green Bay Packers trailing the Tampa Bay Bucks 31-23, LaFleur was faced with a crucial decision. Does he go for it on 4th and goal from the Bucks' 8-yard line and hope that Aaron Rodgers and company can tie the game up with a touchdown and a 2-point conversion? Or does he kick the field goal and rely on his defense and his three timeouts to give his offense one more shot to win it? Seeing as how he had Aaron Rodgers as his quarterback and the fact that a field goal would still leave the Packers needing a touchdown to win it, the decision seems like an easy one. Unfortunately for the Packers, LaFleur had other ideas. Instead of going for it here on fourth and goal, Crosby makes this a five-point game again. He decided to kick the field goal and put the games in the hands of his underachieving defense, which had struggled all day. And that decision proved to be a costly one, as the Bucks' offense converted a couple of first downs to ice the game, without ever giving Rodgers and the Packers' offense another chance. After the game, LeFleur faced a ton of criticism for his decision to kick the field goal. Went into the decision to kick the field goal there on fourth and eight, and do you regret that in hindsight? Yeah, anytime it doesn't work out, you always regret it, right? But uh, it was just uh, the circumstances of having three shots and coming away with no yards um, and knowing that you not only need the touchdown, but you'd need the two point. So the way I was looking at it was we essentially had four timeouts with the two minute warning. And, you know, we, we knew we needed to get a stop. And I thought we were going to have a stop there at the end, but, you know, they, we got called for, for the PI. Um, and it didn't work out. So I think anytime something doesn't work out, do you regret it? Sure. But we're always going to be process-driven here. And the way our defense was battling, the way our defense was playing, we felt like it was the right decision to do. And uh, it just didn't work out.
Even Aaron Rodgers wasn't happy with the decision. And can you blame him? His head coach essentially took the ball out of his hands and cost him a shot at a second Lombardi trophy with his ultra conservative play calling. In that situation, first and goal on the, on the eight, I thought it was four down territory. Number three, Texans fake punt debacle sparks chief comeback. The Houston Texans stormed out to a shocking 24 to zero lead against the Kansas City Chiefs early in the second quarter of their 2019 AFC Divisional Round Showdown. Patrick Mahomes and KC finally got it going with a quick touchdown drive to cut the lead to 17. On the ensuing drive, Houston head coach Bill O'Brien showed zero trust in his defense. Facing a fourth and four on their own 31 yard line, he called for a fake punt that the Chiefs stopped easily. The Chiefs would score three more touchdowns in the quarter to go from a 24-0 deficit to a 28-24 lead. They kept their feet on the gas pedal the rest of the way and cruised to a 51-31 victory. It could just be us, but uh, if you are going to go for it on fourth down, coach, maybe just ask your superstars like Deshaun Watson and DeAndre Hopkins to make a play. We just uh, we felt like you know we weren't going to be able to punt it too many times today. You know We felt like... Um that we had to try to manufacture some points, manufacture some yards, and uh, just didn't work out. You know, it's just something we decided to do, but uh, the play didn't work. Number two, Red Right 88. The Cleveland Browns had a trip to the 1980 AFC Championship game in the bag. All they had to do was follow basic logic and play it safe. They trailed the Oakland Raiders 14 to 12 with less than a minute to go in their AFC Divisional Round matchup. Cleveland had the ball at the Raiders 13 yard line, only 49 seconds left. They just had to run the ball and play for an easy game-winning field goal. Browns head coach Sam Rudy Gliano called a passing play and instructed quarterback Brian Sipe to simply throw the ball into Lake Erie if nobody was open. Sipe took the snap and dropped back before tossing the pass into the end zone for Ozzie Newsom. But just when it looked like Newsom would play hero, Mike Davis of the Raiders cut in front of the game ceiling pick. That's what happens when you get overly aggressive for no reason whatsoever. Number one. Pete Carroll's Super Bowl gaffe. Everybody knows what happened here. Trailing the Patriots by four in Super Bowl 48, the Seahawks needed a touchdown to win. The usually clutch Russell Wilson pieced together a superb drive that brought Seattle to the New England Five. On first and goal, Marshawn Lynch took the handoff and got tackled half a yard short of the end zone. Bill Belichick decided against using his timeout, allowing Seattle to melt the clock. Handing it off to beast mode from a half yard out should have been the easiest call any coach in any sport has ever made. But instead, Carol picked the worst possible time to get cute. To this date, people are still left to wonder what exactly was going through Pete Carroll's mind. Lynch was like only the NFL's most unstoppable running back at the time. But hey, which do you think is the worst playoff coaching decision in NFL history? Let us know in the comment section below. If you like this video and learned a thing or two, clicking the like button helps out a ton. And hey, we appreciate it. If this is your first time coming around to CPS though, subscribing is a great idea because we put out videos like this every single day. But as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you guys next time.